Uh, my name is Dr. Natalie. I'm one of the founders of ERIE. ERIE stands for Entheogenic Research Integration and Education. It is an organization that was born out of a class that a group of us were um, very engaged in about three and a half years ago. Several students in an entheogenic shamanism course within the East-West Psychology Program. We just found ourselves having an ongoing conversation that we wanted to continue deepening and deepening and deepening. And so we said, well, we might as well create a student group and start talking about these things together. And within a month, we had put on a conference and hosted, I don't even know how many speakers, maybe 20 speakers or more, um, including Jim Fadiman and many other amazing uh, contributors to this field. And we had about 120 people in attendance. We were sold out at capacity. And from that point forward, we've pretty much hosted monthly events. And we have um, really been supporting a forum that encourages open a dialogue or polylogue, as I like to think of it, including many voices um, from within the entheogenic community. We're also um, putting together some resources to help people who want to do research and work in this field, and we're also um, expanding our offerings around integration support. There was a period of time here at CIIS where we hosted integration circles, and those were an opportunity for people within the local and extended community to come and share about an entheogenic experience or a transpersonal experience that they had, and maybe they hadn't ever had a safe context to do that within before. So that was a really valuable offering, um, but for some logistical reasons where those are slightly on pause. Um, one of our bigger visions is to create a headquarters in the near future where we can um, host our events, uh, provide an ongoing integration station, which we envision as a creative space where people can come and um, process through transpersonal or entheogenic experiences and work in creative ways with movement and art and also have um, some therapists uh, and guides on hand who can help people who are integrating experiences. Um, so we have a couple of big visions. Stay tuned for... Um, an upcoming crowdfunding campaign because we will need some support to manifest that. Okay, um, it's my great pleasure to be hosting Dr. Nick Cozy this evening. Um, Nick and I met each other about three years ago at a conference where I happened to be speaking about some of the nutritional, supplemental, and herbal allies that people who are choosing to work with entheogens might consider having in their apothecary to support their experiences should they choose to have those experiences. And there were a couple slides in which I was totally nerding out on chemistry because prior to becoming a doctor, I was a pharmaceutical chemist. And Nick and I were speaking the same language. He came up to me after and said, oh yeah, and we just went down the rabbit hole of chemistry as chemistry-minded people do. And thus was born this amazing um, you know, intellectual relationship. And um, Nick and I maintained contact and stayed friends over all these years. And <clears throat> about a year later, I had the opportunity to really see Nick's heart and to have um, some time with some friends out in nature and just really experience the, the beauty of Nick's heart. So not only was I fascinated by his mind, but then got to have this direct experience of his beautiful heart. Um, he is a professor of pharmacology at the University of Wisconsin, um, University of Wisconsin in Madison, and he's also uh, one of the few chemists in the country that has the opportunity to synthesize Schedule One substances, and he is uh, one of the chemists that makes particularly psilocybin for the research studies um, that are going on at Johns Hopkins and NYU. And it's just such a beautiful thing to consider from the perspective of medicine that not only does Nick have the brains, not only did he optimize the synthesis of psilocybin, but he's pouring his heart and love into that medicine and that's touching people in these studies. And um, yeah, it's just such a great pleasure and so excited to have you here, Nick. Let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you for that <clears throat> warm introduction. 
And thank you, everybody, for coming here tonight. I, before I get started, I want to thank um, CIIS and Erie, and in particular, Dr. Natalie Metz, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to talk about some of the work that we're doing in Wisconsin, and also just broadly about psilocybin mushrooms. Um, my talk tonight is entitled uh, Magic Mushroom Medicine. And what I'd like to do, and I, and I realize from looking around this room that uh, perhaps my first few introductory slides might be, uh, you know, describing psychedelics. Uh, you, it seems like I have the idea that you probably know much about these. Uh, but I, I wanted to gear this to a, a wide audience and kind of not leave anyone out and kind of just give us some basic um, material to work with. Um, talk a little bit about the history of psilocybin mushrooms um, and then discuss some of the clinical trials that are ongoing with these mushrooms. And then I'll focus specifically on the work we're doing um, in Madison, Wisconsin, um, in conjunction with the School of Pharmacy and, and some other folks. Um, and so that's what we'll do. Uh, so the first is, you know, what are psychedelics? And this is one of the slides that I, I feel is probably maybe too basic. But uh, let's just say that there are substances that produce um, some or all of the following effects. So their main notoriety comes from their ability to produce changes in sensory perception. Um, they alter in particular visual sensations, auditory um, perception, um, tactile uh, perception, and, and all of the senses, really. And there's a property called synesthesia, which is often experienced in a psychedelic session. This refers to the um, perception of a stimulus in one sensory modality um, that has actually occurred, the stimulus has occurred in another sensory modality. So um, seeing music, for example, or tasting a color, this is synesthesia. Um, there's usually very detailed eyes closed um, imagery, uh, so-called eidetic imagery. There's often an altered time and space perception. The time perception is typically um, extended, so time typically seems to take much longer than actual clock time. And changes in body image. Um, sometimes people take on the persona of an animal or um, their own body image changes. They become their ancestors or um, a variety of, of things uh, which uh, many of you might be familiar with. Intense mood changes are often seen and this can range from euphoria to sadness to joy to any human emotion, uh, feelings of love, um, and, and others. Enhanced recall or memory. Um, people may be able to recall events from childhood which they've long forgotten, and some people even um, experience uh, so-called past, live, uh, past lives memory. <clears throat> Interpersonal and transpersonal awareness. Um, people feel that they're connected to other people and other beings. Everything is one. Uh, so uh, a dissolution of ego boundaries, increased empathy, people feel that they can feel what others are feeling. And paranormal phenomena are often seen. So feeling that uh, there's a shared consciousness that people are essentially hearing other people's thoughts or feeling other people's thoughts uh, and even uh, precognition. A sense of profound meaning or insight, uh, feelings of wonder, awe, and beauty, feelings as if one is with God or actually is God, and uh, there's no separation from the Creator and oneself. Um, and this has lent the use of these agents, the, these kind of feelings um, in religious or spiritual ceremonies. They're uh, widely used for that and have been for millennia, and in particular psilocybin mushrooms have. And just a word about the importance of set and setting. Uh, set is one's mental 
set that one brings to the experience. This refers to past experiences, childhood experiences, uh, the current set, uh, how happy you are with your life, uh, um, or maybe you're sad with your life. So this is mental set, and then setting refers to the physical environment in which an experience is taking place. And so these are important factors that may color the experience and make it either very positive or, or perhaps not so much. Uh, the word psychedelic uh, itself uh, means mind manifesting, and it derives from a conversation, actually an exchange of letters uh, between Aldous Huxley, uh, shown here on the left, and Humphrey Osmond, um, a doctor from mm, Saskatchewan. And uh, during their correspondence, they're trying to come up with a, a word to describe the experience um, of LSD and mescaline, um, which were known at the time. And Aldous Huxley said, to make this mundane world sublime, take half a gram of phenerothyme, uh, phenerothyme referring to something that allows spirit to uh, come out, to manifest, uh, to which Humphrey Osmond responded, to fathom hell or soar angelic, just take a pinch of psychedelic, which means mind man manifesting. And they're, they're both kind of fun words, but psychedelic is the one that has stuck. And that word became very popular um, after these agents uh, and were made illegal in the 1960s. Uh, the word hallucinogen uh, came in vogue, especially in the scientific literature. Um, they're not really hallucinogenic, and I think that's a little bit of an inaccurate word um, because the it, people typically aren't really seeing things that aren't there. Uh, it just seems that things are maybe perhaps more amplified or there's people get insights into things that already exist. Um, I, I like the word psychedelic. It's the word I use. Um, another word is entheogen. You heard Dr. Metz uh, refer to that, and that refers to bringing out the God within. I kind of reserve that term uh, for when these agents are used m with a specific intent of evoking spirit or God. Th there are other ways to use these uh, substances, for example, to enhance creativity, and that uh, perhaps is not necessarily related to um, a, a God experience. Um, some of the ways they are used, uh, I, I, I mentioned this earlier, uh, for shamanic or religious or theogenic experiences. This, in particular, Native peoples have been using these agents for millennia for these purposes, and people today use them for these purposes as well. <clears throat> uh, they, some people use them for sensory or aesthetic enhancement. Um, I mean, what would a Grateful Dead show be without LSD, um, it'd probably be pretty good anyway. But um, self-exploration or insight uh, is another use for these agents. Uh, enhanced creativity and problem solving. Um, again, I would consider this a non-entheogenic use, uh, but nevertheless, uh, they seem to allow people to have insights into maybe a problem that they're working on that they haven't had a breakthrough with and sometimes psychedelics can allow that breakthrough. Um, currently uh, therapeutic and psychological healing, uh, that's Really, they've been used for that for quite a while, but the focus nowadays in the clinical trials is really for a therapeutic use uh, to help people get past trauma that they might have had um, earlier in life. And then for consciousness and neuroscience research, there's a lot of interest in learning where these agents act in the brain, uh, what circuits are uh, excited or suppressed. There have been a number of imaging studies done uh, with people who have taken psilocybin and then had their brains uh, imaged by um, uh, magnetic resonance imaging or another method. And you can see specific areas that these agents seem to affect. And this really tells us basically, gives us basic information on how our brains function. And so this is an entirely uh, valid and, and reasonable way to use these agents. So what are psychedelic mushrooms uh, kind of focusing in on tonight's uh, focus. Um, there are, uh, last time I looked, something like 400 species of mushrooms around the world that produce uh, the agents that are uh, active in 
uh, psychedelic mushrooms. Uh, this is one species, uh, Psilocybe mexicana, uh, shown here, and there are a number of others. So this is a psychedelic mushroom, a, a species of psychedelic mushroom. Um, they've been used, as I said, uh, for millennia. There is some evidence that, um, in, in particular in uh, Mexico, although there are psychedelic mushrooms around the world, but it's the uh, peoples in mid-Mexico uh, that have been using them and where they were first introduced to Western science, which I will describe in a few minutes. So this is a mushroom stone um, that was, uh, this is, is from a book, The Wondrous Mushroom um, Person with a kind of a mushroom growing out of their back. Uh, there are numerous examples of these mushroom stones. These are from um, uh, Mexico. Uh, this is a uh, so-called codex, uh, Mixateco co uh, codex. These people, um, actually came out of an Aztec society. And if you look uh, carefully, you'll see that these peop these images here are all holding mushrooms in their hands. I don't know if you can see these in the back. Um, it's kind of a, a, a busy, a busy uh, image, uh, but they're all holding uh, mushrooms. So um, this is uh, data to about, um, I think it was discovered about um, 1500 uh, AD or so. Um, this is an image um, by Cat Harrison of uh, a mushroom man found in a cave in northern Africa. Um, and so there are mushrooms sprouting out all over the body and it certainly looks uh, pretty psychedelic. Um, so I suspect that they were, um, there's something that evoked this kind of image. Here's another uh, drawing from the 16th century um, showing uh, mushrooms and then a man eating the mushrooms and then a god uh, behind the man who is uh, purportedly speaking uh, through the mushroom. So this is an example of you know using the mushrooms to contact the creator or, or gods in this case. Uh, I don't suppose they were monotheistic so um, it just gives access to spiritual uh, spaces. That's just a little <laughs> interlude there. <laughs> um, so I'd like to talk next about uh, what is psilocybin. So this is a substance that's actually found in the mushrooms like the psilocybin mexicana I showed you. <clears throat> um, and talk a little bit about the discovery of psilocybin. <clears throat> so in Late June 1955, Robert Gordon Wasson and Alan Richardson were invited to partake in a mushroom ceremony um, in central Mexico. And uh, this uh, ceremony was guided or, um, yeah, it was guided by a, a curandera by the name of Maria Sabina. In the article that Wasson subsequently wrote about his study, he actually changed her name and it only came out later that it, her real name was Maria Sabina and then everybody um, uh, wanted to go to central Mexico and find Maria Sabina and she became famous for it. But he described his experience in an article called Seeking the Magic Mushroom published in Life magazine in 1957, so this is a couple years later, I understand that he actually did not favor the use of the word magic mushroom, but it was one of the editors at Life that thought it would give a little more cachet uh, to the article, and it, it, that word has stuck too because we call them magic mushrooms um, to this day. Uh, later, uh, Wasson went back and he was accompanied by a an internationally famous mycologist by the name of Roger Heim who obtained some samples of these mushrooms and then sent these to the chemist Albert Hoffman who worked at Sandoz and as you may know he was the person who discovered LSD um, and he discovered that LSD was active in 1943 and had synthesized it earlier in 1938. So Hoffman uh, got these samples and extracted uh, the mushroom tissue 
and discovered through self-experiments uh, where the active fraction was and it was, lo and behold, it was this uh, substance that then was named psilocybin and he developed a synthesis for psilocybin and went on later to synthesize a number of other agents related to psilocybin, um, a number of uh, analogs. And at this time in the you know mid to late 1950s, there was great interest in brain chemistry. And it was like really before that time, people didn't realize that neurochemistry was an important determinant of experience and mood and memory. People thought the brain was largely electrical in nature and it wasn't until the early 50s where these like things like serotonin were discovered and dopamine uh, later that people realized that these biochemicals influenced mood and really it was these discoveries that led to the uh, you know, pharmaceutical industry developing drugs like, you know, Prozac and, and, and other agents. Um, so, but it was really um, work with LSD and psilocybin uh, that kind of led people down this path that here are substances that look like this chemical that we find in the brain. They produce profound changes in sensory perception and in mood. And so maybe um, serotonin is active in, in those areas as well. This is the chemical structure of psilocybin. I, I don't have a whole lot of chemistry slides on here. I do have one or two more, um, but um, just not to belabor the point, this is um, this core structure in here is called a tryptamine. And so psilocybin is 4-phosphoryl uh, um, dimethyl tryptamine. It's chemically not too far away from serotonin um, so serotonin uh, doesn't have these two methyl groups on here. They're hydrogens, and serotonin has an OH, OH group sticking off here instead of this. Um, if you remove this group here the, at the 4 position, this phosphoryl group, you get DMT, which is another psychedelic agent also found in plants. Uh, so they're very closely related chemically, and there are a number of other agents too. So Sandoz, uh, where Albert Hoffman worked, um, of course at the time they were making LSD available to researchers around the world, uh, also made psilocybin available uh, to researchers. And here's a bottle of Sandoz psilocybin. Um, they branded it Indocybin. Uh, that was their brand name for psilocybin. They provided it in two, in two milligram uh, tablets which we now know is quite low. Um, a standard kind of psychedelic dose is in the at least 15 to 20 milligram range. Uh, so uh, two milligrams is, is low, um, but I guess it allows one to titrate the experience a little bit um, by having it kind of uh, granular, if you like, uh, the, the dose being uh, easily adjustable. Psilocybin itself is not believed to be the active agent. Um, in vivo, in the body, psilocybin is converted to psilocin. So the structure on the right side here is psilocin. So it's 4-hydroxy-DMT. Uh, essentially, that's another way you could name this. Um, and we know that psilocin is active, and we also know that psilocybin is rapidly converted in the in the blood to uh, psilocin. So that's been the consensus. Um, I believe that if one ingests pure psilocin, they might have a different experience than if they take pure psilocybin. Just from uh, the fact that this has to be converted to this and that takes some time and if you take the psilocin it's immediately available and so we know that the time course of drugs attaching to their receptor sites in the brain is important in shaping the experience. And the experience of pure psilocybin uh, is different from the experience of psilocybin mushrooms. And the reason for that is mushrooms uh, produce a number of other related compounds shown on this slide. Uh, so this is psilocybin again, and this is a substance called baocystin, 
which is similar to psilocybin, but it's missing one of those methyl groups. And then there's norbeocystin shown here. Um, and these are all intermediates in the biosynthesis of psilocybin in the mushroom. And so they're found at various degrees, and it depends on the species of mushrooms. Uh, but it's quite likely that these other molecules color or shade the psilocybin experience. So if you just take pure psilocybin, it's going to be different than if you take this cocktail uh, of other tryptamines. It's really, there's very little known about that, and I am unaware of any studies with pure baocystin or nor baocystin, uh, but I, I think it would be an interesting area of exploration. So um, what does psilocybin do? I have a little clip I'd like to show you. As you might expect, it's going to do those things we talked about on the first slide, but I think this clip is kind of uh, nice and concise. This is a clip with Robin Carhart Harris and um, Roland Griffiths. Let's see if this works. What seems to happen in the psychedelic state is that when something is positive, it has the potential to be incredibly positive to the extent of being euphoric and, and ecstatic. But similarly, if something uh, is negative, it has the potential to be quite hellish and dysphoric and frightening. Psilocybin is found in magic mushrooms and it's a compound that is broken down in the body into another compound which is very very similar to a naturally occurring neurotransmitter in the brain or chemical messenger in the brain and that's called serotonin. Now their pharmacology is subtly different but what's so interesting about this drug is that that subtle difference in its pharmacology confers profound effects on consciousness. Our first study was published in 2006 in healthy volunteers uh, who received uh, psilocybin or a comparator drug, this was all in a blinded fashion, under uh, optimally supported conditions uh, in which they lay down on the couch, had eye shades on, headphones through which they listened to a program of recorded music. They were in the presence of two people with whom they had already developed a trusting relationship. Uh, and um, under those conditions, uh, a high percentage of people end up reporting a, <clears throat> a constellation of experiences, the most interesting piece of which is that it really falls into a category of something the psychology of religion people talk about as a primary mystical experience. Analogy that you could use to describe how the drug affects brain activity is either to say that brain activity becomes relatively disordered or disorganized in the state. Another thing that you could say is that it's not entire disorder, that rather it's more like the brain enters a more kind of anarchic state. It's fascinating. I think one of the interesting uh, implications of this kind of work is that we're bi biologically ha hardwired for having these kinds of experiences. It's not just unique to mystics, you know, spending years of meditation in a cave, that this is part of the human biology to have these kind of integrative experiences that can really set the stage and the platform for remarkable personal change. And our research has really been looking at how it works in the brain. Uh, so we've used a number of different brain image, imaging modalities or brain scanning modalities. Uh, one of them is functional magnetic resonance imaging which uses high, high field uh, magnets to look at changes in uh, brain blood flow. The brain imaging work that we've done, one of the interesting findings was that uh, there's there was a really quite marked decrease in brain activity in a particular region of the brain which is overactive in depression. Uh, so this uh, region of the prefrontal cortex is, is uh, typically highly active in depression and a range of effective treatments for depression 
all normalize this overactivity in this um, region of the prefrontal cortex. And psilocybin did exactly that, and it did it very rapidly. We're running two different trials now at Johns Hopkins. Uh, one is in cancer patients who are anxious or depressed secondary to their cancer diagnosis, generally a life-threatening cancer diagnosis. Although we haven't touched their disease process, they still experience the pain. They're still dealing with the fact that they're going to leave their loved ones or their children. In some cases, these are parents of, uh, uh, of, uh, of kids who are, who are young. Um, that sadness is still there, but there's also a larger framing of that, and so it's very touching. There's a growing consensus among scientists that drug laws and prohibition around psychedelic drugs is irrational, it's unhelpful, uh, and it, potentially it's, it's um, precluding uh, uh, people who are unwell getting effective treatment, and that's a shame. These are remarkable compounds with, I think, remarkable implications if we can understand uh, how they work and why they work. Okay, <clears throat> so that was, um, I think, well said. <clears throat> and Dr. Griffiths has run some of the first um, human clinical trials with psilocybin. We'll say a little bit more about those in a few minutes. And the Hopkins Center is doing a lot of work. They're doing some addictions work, uh, continuing work with the uh, anxiety associated with a cancer diagnosis. Uh, they're recruiting for some uh, um, work in uh, religious professionals uh, and others. So I'd like to move now into the ongoing clinical trials. <clears throat> And so when a, when a drug is developed, um, before it can be approved for disbursement or, or, or prescription to people, it has to be approved by the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. And it goes through this kind of, uh, a drug goes through this kind of process uh, shown on this slide. And this is true of really any drug. Uh, it could be a antibiotic, it could be an antidepressant, uh, it could be an anti-seizure drug. Initially, <clears throat> there was some in vitro work done, work done in, in the laboratory in glass, so the, it doesn't go into humans uh, at that uh, stage. Then there's generally some animal testing done. It has, sometimes that uh, shows some toxicity or effects that were not anticipated and that's enough to kill a drug uh, right there. But if a drug makes it um, through these initial phases then it's given to human beings and there are generally three phases of study before a drug is given to a human being. The first phase is called phase one st uh, studies and these are kind of a, are small groups of subjects, small groups of volunteers. And these are healthy people. So they're normal, healthy people. In fact, they, they have to be healthy to be accepted into a phase one study. And the questions we try to answer in phase one is, is the drug safe at the anticipated doses that are going to be given? And then... And the other question is, what are its pharmacokinetics? And I'll say a little bit more about pharmacokinetics in a few minutes, but basically it's the time course of a drug moving through the body. And from pharmacokinetics, we can get things like, what is the half-life of the drug? What is, um, is, what are its metabolites? Um, how is it excreted? These are all important data that must be learned before a drug uh, can move into the second phase. So in phase two, there are larger studies, and now we ask the question, does it work in patients? So does this work in people who have the disease for which the drug is intended? And so this is a, these are tests of efficacy. Is the drug effective? And then in phase three, uh, generally these are multi-site studies, and there are many more patients enrolled. And 
usually a double blind study is done, although that's difficult to do with psychedelic drugs because they produce such profound changes and it's apparent within a short time who got the placebo and who got the psilocybin. So uh, there's some attempt to at least give people act, so-called active placebos. So these would be drugs that produce some sort of psychoactive effect such as methylphenidate, uh, this is Ritalin, which Roland Griffiths used in his studies. So people can feel that something changed, but it's, it's certainly not psychedelic. So it, it's a little bit of a better control than just giving somebody a blank. If the drug goes through phase three studies and the efficacy that was seen in phase two has been confirmed now in a larger group, and the safety and pharmacokinetics are also confirmed, um, then the drug can be approved. The data is submitted to the FDA and the drug will approve it for the condition. Now, they require a specific condition. So when you're designing one of these studies, uh, for example, with psilocybin and the anxiety, it, it, they want a well-defined study. So it's treatment-resistant anxiety secondary to a diagnosis of cancer, for example. Um, and so then you look to see whether the drug relieves that anxiety or makes people feel better. Um, and, and that would be the, the end point. That would be the metric that would be looked at. And then once a drug is uh, approved, then doctors can prescribe that drug. Now with psilocybin, it, it's never going to be available at your corner pharmacy um, because of the changes it does. It's got to kind of really be taken um, in controlled conditions. I mean, um, you'd be able to get it in a clinic perhaps. So you'd have to go to a clinic and it would be given under supervised conditions. Um, and that, I, I mean, at least the way I see it, I mean, if it, I, I'd be happy to hear any other um, points of view on whether you think it might be available um, in a pharmacy to take home. Um, but anyway, so these are the trials. Uh, and now I would say that the, the phases here generally go in this order, but it's not required that they do. So the Griffith study and the NYU study and the studies at UCLA with uh, Charles Grobe, these are all phase two studies. The study we're doing now at uh, University of Wisconsin is really a phase one study. We have healthy, normal people, and we're, we're measuring the pharmacokinetics. So it doesn't, it's not required that they be temporally uh, um, sequential as this chart shows. 